Welcome to the Avatar Project, or welcome to my project, the Avatar Project and you. Uh, blah. Um, so, if y'all are in a hurry, if some of you guys got things to do, um, and you don't have time to sit around for the whole talk, uh, this is what it's all about right here. Um, I have a website, uh, it's literally hosted on a server in my basement right next to me. Um, and the PDF for the training documents are all on the server. Um, it's a 500 plus page PDF, but don't let it, uh, don't be afraid of, at the size. I'll be getting into that stuff in a little bit. Uh, for the rest of you that want to stay around, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I am, my name is Tony Robinson. I go by uh, DA667 on social media. I'm primarily on Twitter. Um, you guys got my email address, so if any of you want to reach out or if you got questions about something afterwards, don't be a stranger. Um, I'm more than willing to help wherever I can. So um, I've done threat intelligence in the past, malware analysis. I've worked for the government. I've worked for big power companies. I've been all over the place. Uh, I love video games. One of my favorites uh, right now that the uh, code name of the book is based off of is XCOM 2. So uh, I am a killer of A's. And uh, my friends on social media have lovely pictures of me that they photoshopped into me all over the damn place. Like the one in the bottom corner there. That's actually from Archer. That's not, that's not what I do in real life. So um, some of my best accomplishments. Uh, at one point in my life, uh, ESET had classified me as a social media threat. Um, so they have some kind of social media scanner program or something or other that uh, if you tweet C2, C2 or malware or information about it, occasionally it'll say, this is a social media threat. So I got uh, classified as a threat by uh, anti-malware and that was the best day of my life. Um, I have been told I'm a pretty good storyteller. Um, I'll just throw a quick one out there right now. Uh, you guys are familiar with CCDC, um, you know, rumor, you know, in spite of whatever rumors you may or may not know, I'm not a red teamer, but uh, somehow I found my way on the uh, uh, Mid-Atlantic region CCDC team through uh, various contacts, and um, I was competent enough to shovel shells to the guys who were doing the more evil stuff, so... Um, it was a wild set of connections. Um, I do a podcast with a buddy of mine uh, named Ben Heise, uh, Rally Security. We um, air every Friday at like, uh, I want to say it's uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, and he was one of the originals. His company was one of the original companies that uh, organized it. And he was like, we don't have a red team or we need an extra slot. And I was just like, I'll do it. So that's how I ended up on the red team in Mid-Atlantic CCDC as a blue teamer. I was like, man, I am the filthy turncoat in here, aren't I? So, um, all that being said, just random things here and there about me. Um, I don't know how to use a computer. <laughs> so, let's get into what this uh, little talk is all about. Um, what is the Avatar Project? So, uh, believe it or not, I have tried writing a book no less than two or three times now. Um, at first, I tried writing a book. I wanted to focus on um, how to build a dynamic malware analysis lab. Um, I love tearing apart malware. I love running it in sandboxes. And I've picked up those skills over, um, over a career in InfoSec, and I wanted to share them. And then uh, various things happened. As and I got side. I got um sides, or I had other side projects or the things that took uh, precedence, so that fell by the wayside. Then um, I ended up getting this job at Hurricane Labs. Uh, that's the MSSP that I work for. They're based out of Ohio, and uh, they allow for remote work. Um, so they hired me on. I'm pretty happy where I'm at. And one day, my boss came up to me and said, um, "Our stock analyst, we could use some training for him." and you seem to be pretty good at this writing thing. So would you like extra money? I was like, yeah, just like anybody else who's motivated by money. Yeah, sure, I'll write some stuff. And I started writing a very simple, uh, I wrote a very simple lab. It was just like, here's how to install Snort or, Suric or Suricata. Um, here's how to run PFSense and here's how to uh, bridge virtual networks in VirtualBox, just using that stuff. 
So it started off as a very simple project and it eventually blew up into something way more massive. So it was just, here's how to do IDS and IPS and turn into the, this little project of mine turn in, eventually turned into a book because uh, um, at first I was like, well, what if uh, the SOC analysts don't want to use VirtualBox? Like uh, our, a bunch of our analysts had VMware Workstation. Some of them had VMware Fusion. Uh, a couple of them wanted to work with uh, ESXi. And then in the middle of all that, I ended up finding out about uh, client Hyper-V, which is definitely an awesome thing. Y'all are y'all are in college right now, so if you can get a uh, cheap or a free copy of Windows uh, Education Edition, Enterprise Edition, um, any of those um, through uh, TechNet or other resources through uh, the college, I highly recommend doing it and uh, using client Hyper-V if you got to use Windows. Um, uh, the hyper this hypervisor is like on par with uh, VMware Workstation and Fusion, and it comes free with the OS. So if you're going to use Windows, I would highly recommend it. Um, so uh, uh, digressing along, so I ended up expanding the guide and reproducing it across five different hypervisors. And then I started as like, well, uh, one of our bread and butter things that we do at our company is we build our security service around Splunk and uh, enterprise security for Splunk, which is we just tell the customers, we don't care what you got, just send the logs to us so we can build alerts around it. So it was like, well, I work for a company that uses Splunk. I should probably teach people how to actually install it and send logs to it. So um, that's why I'm using that and, you know, not um, uh, an elk stack or um, gray log or other uh, log aggregation tools. It's simply what I know, what I picked up along the way. And uh, so the too long didn't listen is it turned, it went from the very simple project to something incredibly complex really quickly. So I show people how to build this with the book that I'm reading. And uh, as I said, it's pretty complex and there's a lot of stuff going on here, but uh, there are, in essence, there are four networks being represented here. Um, your bridge network, management network, and IPS one and two networks. The bridge network represents a physical network that your hosted or bare metal hypervisor. So your box running virtual box or ESXi, that's the network that it's connected to. Um, or if you're using um, a bare metal hypervisor, you might have a management workstation or jump box that you manage that uh, ESXi server from. And that would that's why there's that dotted line and that uh, transparent box in the uh, green there. That's representative of an uh, um, external box that you would use to configure uh, ESXi or something. Um, and then the bottom three networks here, those are all virtual networks. Um, there is a PFSense gateway that sits between three of them. Why, th why are there four networks? What's, what's the deal with the fourth one? I'm, get I'm getting to that. So the PFSense gateway is what controls ingress, egress, um, and all that between the various networks. Make sure that uh, you know your analysis machines in the IPS networks can't talk to the management network, can't talk to the uh, local network, can only talk to the internet and only if you want them to. Um, and various things of that nature. So the management network is where I decided the, the uh, Splunk VM should go and one of three network interfaces for the uh, IPS VM. Uh, readers have to install Snort or Suricata um, in IPS mode. And then we come over here to the uh, IPS one and two networks. You have a Kali Linux VM sitting on the IPS one network, and then you have a Metasploitable two VM sitting at the very bottom there in that red network, the uh, IPS two network. And you'll notice that there's a uh, bright dotted uh, neon line there between IPS interface one and interface two. Um, that is a network bridge that uh, Sur Suricata or Snort is configured to use. Um, it's called AF packet mode. And that is what allows this thing to uh, kind of bridge the virtual networks together. Um, the traffic goes through the VM. That's the unique thing about this uh, project. That's what allows it to be so flexible and allows it to do what it does. So, uh, that VM, if it's turned on and the Suricata or Snort surface is running, 
you're bridging network traffic from point A to point B and you're able to reach the rest of the networks. But if you needed to do offline analysis or if there was something that you wanted to practice with that you thought would impact uh, the rest of your virtual networks or could potentially uh, cause issues with uh, your physical network, you simply turn off the IPS VM and it becomes a host only network. So um, in NSM terminology, this is what's called a fail close network. And that lets you switch from a network that has connectivity, full connectivity to the internet to closed off at a moment's notice. If there's infection issues or, oh crap, my uh, VM that I just uh, ran a malware payload on in the IPS2 network is trying to DDoS something, that allows you to cut it off immediately without further impact. And that's what gives a lot of this network, this, uh, this virtual network, a lot of the flexibility that it has is uh, through that um, AF packet bridge behind the firewall. Um, so I show people how to build this network and set up all these things on various different hypervisors. And then I show them how to run it on any one of these hypervisors of their choice. Uh, some people ask, um, why didn't you cover KVM? Why didn't you cover QMU? Why didn't you cover Citrix Zen Server, Beehive? And honest to God, it's just because it's what I knew. That's the first thing, you know, first and foremost, it's what I know and it's what I'm most familiar with. And then the other part of it is that these are the most common hypervisors that you see out there in the wild today. Uh, if you go to any enterprise or any corporation, they're either running VirtualBox, they're running ESXi, they're running Hyper-V, our server-side Hyper-V because, well, we already got Windows license, let's just run with that. Or they're using some version of VMware somewhere. So I decided let's go with the uh, low-hanging fruit, let's go with the common stuff. And I've actually had a couple people say, I know how to do this on KVM, you want me to write a guide? I'm like, yeah, sure, please do that. You know, uh, redistribute it however you want. If you can reproduce the same network setup, do it. So um, that's why I just picked those five in particular. So what if, you know, this network that I have here, this is considered a baseline. This is considered a starting point and it's great that, you know, I teach you how to do this across so many different hypervisors, but, uh, you know, what are some different ideas or what are some different ways that you can reconfigure this virtual network to suit your needs? Maybe you, instead of, uh, you know, pen testing with Kali and uh, doing Metasploitable 2 and getting your introduction to penetration testing, maybe you want to set up a um, IT um, ops or DevOps or configuration management lab where you mess with uh, Salt Stack, Ansible, um, Puppet, Chef, those things. Um, maybe you want to set up a more complicated pen testing lab than just a Metasploitable 2 VM. Or maybe you want a full blown uh, malware analysis uh, suite with uh, more NSM software than just an inline IPS. Maybe you want to experiment with Bro or. Uh, you want to do uh, more detailed flow analysis and collect DNS records and HTTP headers and all those fun things. So I've got a couple, you know, at the very end of the book, I was like, well, this is a starting point. And now that you know how to do this, you can take it in any direction you want. But I was just like, here's a couple of suggestions to get you started. You know, so we have a very basic lab that we test uh, the kind of, or we use Metasploitable 2 and let, in, uh, Kali to just test that the AF packet bridge is working. But if you wanted to make a more complicated pen testing lab, this is just a variation of that same diagram. You'll notice that you know, the Kali Linux box, the other uh, boxes in the management network and the bridge network, all of that has stayed the same. But when you get into the IPS2 network, that's where you would add more VMs or remove some VMs or make changes that you wanted to uh, do to your network. So. Um, uh, right here, I right have, here, for instance, have um, a, a firewall that's uh, sitting in front of all the VMs. Maybe you would do something akin to block all access. You would assume that anything on the IPS1 network would be internet connected, and you would block all access to at everything but ADM 443 inbound. So that first hit there, the line from the firewall to the vulnerable web app, Maybe you'd have to exploit it and get a web shell, and then you have to escalate privileges and figure out how to pivot from that box to 
various other boxes until you get all the way to the domain controller on all the way on the inside three boxes deep so you know this is just one scenario this is one way that you can take it you know if you want to get into advanced red teaming and tactics like that so um this is a, another variation of it uh with a uh, nsm malware analysis lab setup um again you see that most of the networks are very similar um the kali linux vm is gone because if you're doing malware analysis you really don't need it but in its place um you have a sift and remnix vm um there is a guide on there on how to inst install uh, the uh, SANS uh, SIFT and Remnix uh, overlays for Ubuntu Linux. And they have a variety of forensic tools for both uh, um, incident response purposes and malware analysis. So there's a guide on there to where you can combine both of those onto a single VM. And then you have a Windows analysis VM that might be loaded with all your favorite analysis tools or might not have anything on it. And you just use that to execute malware and capture network traffic on your IPS VM that you perhaps installed Bro on, or maybe you configured Suricata to do uh, HTTP and DNS logging in addition to just uh, IDS events. And uh, that third VM there, the uh, minimal Linux VM, that might be what you use for delivering payloads from your workstation to the actual analysis level um, network. So that would be um what you would copy your payloads to and then you would use that vm inside the network to copy it to either the linux analysis vm or the windows analysis vm so again you know this is just another way you can take it and you know you're noticing a pattern here that a lot of the other networks the only one that changes is the ips2 network that's on the other end of that bridge so once again if you have issues or if you have things that you want to test in a totally offline sealed uh network you can just power off the IPS VM and that network is 100% segmented and has no way out um, to no way out to the internet or any of your local hosts. Um, and then the last example we have here is just um, a IT operations, configuration management, DevOps lab. You know, maybe you want to learn how to use LXC, or LXC Docker, um, Ansible, Salt, Puppet, you know, so you would set up a simple environment that has a Windows server to maybe install SCCM or WSS and test out group policy and uh, how group policies distribute or, an, uh, or you might have Linux systems that you install Salt or Ansible on and you want to see how playbooks work and how to how uh, those different uh, content configuration management systems work in pushing configurations from one server to another. Um, again, you know, not much is changing here except the Kali Linux VM is gone again because you're more focused on learning system administration tools than you are on hacking boxes. So one of the questions that I get a lot is um, how can you ensure that the IPS VM, um, how can you ensure that the interfaces that are connected to the IPS 1 and 2 networks um, somehow don't get compromised by an attacker or a piece of malware and are used to pivot to the other networks. And there's a special way that uh, you have Snort set up that if you've done it the right way, and I teach people how to do it, I have it scripted, and it's all documented in the book. If you teach people how to do it the right way, they will never know that there's an inline uh, IPS in that virtual network at all. Um, have a your ethernet interface come up to where it will not respond to ARP request it does not have an ip address all it does is it sits there in promiscuous mode where it gathers traffic from those networks and on one interface and then just forward it forwards it out to the other side of the interface that you have suricata or snort running on so in that way you know, the attackers don't know that the uh, IPS VM is there in any significant way. And uh, in addition to that, even if they did somehow manage to figure out the box was there, it has no IP address, it's not responding to ARP requests, so it has no ability to talk to other hosts on the network. The only way you're getting in there is through magic. I, I honestly don't know where you'd start. You'd need to know day for Snort or Suricata to begin with, but that's splitting hairs at this point. So uh, the reason why I took to writing this book is um, 
I do a lot of mentorship. Yeah, you know, I might not look at it, I might not see it, but uh, a lot of the time when I'm on social media, I'll say, does somebody want some advice or you want, you know, if you need help or if you want recommendations or where to go in your security career, hit me up and I'll try and help you out as best I can. And I used to get a lot of, e- I used to get a lot of direct messages, a lot of emails, a lot of people that were interested in that way more than I thought. So, you know, my usual suggestions were, um, yeah, our first thing I do is say, like, what's your experience? What's your background? What do you know? And based on that, say, you should try reading some of these books, doing some of these challenges, and then eventually learn to make your own lab and learn how to test, uh, test out um, stuff on goldenhub.com. You know, figure out how to compromise a box. Or if you have a memory image, uh, figure out how to, uh, how to run uh, memory forensics tools against it, like uh, uh, recall or uh, you know, other memory analysis tools of that nature. And people say like, well, where do I start? I'm building my own lab. And I would answer that question so many times. I just decided, um, you know, in addition to my company giving me funds to actually just write the book, um, I figured, why don't I just make something that says, here's my recommendations that, you know, for a hardware starting point. And here is a good baseline network and a good baseline VM lab that you can hack against. And, you know, here are other places to get more VMs or here are other places that you can go to learn more about this. Um, you know, in addition to all this, like at the very beginning of the book, you know, if you have no background in InfoSec or IT at all, you know, the first thing I will say is these are wonderful resources that will get you familiar with the uh, Windows and Linux command line. These are resources that will get you familiar with TCP IP. If you know how to do these things, then you should be able to struggle your way through. Um, Something else that I got asked a lot was, why aren't you using stuff like uh, Vagrant or um, any of the HashiCorp tools like Packer or uh, Terraform or things like that? And if any of you are familiar with uh, Zed Shaw from Learn Learning Python the Hard Way, uh, there is a method to the madness, and learning how to do things the hard way um, often has benefits in that, you know, configuration management and DevOps stuff, it abstracts a lot of the, this is how you create a VM, this is how you harden it, this is how you remove excess hardware. It abstracts that stuff out. So me teaching people how to do this manually gives you an appreciation when you start using those config management tools, those DevOps tools, and that stuff to automate all of this stuff. You know what's going on under the hood. If there's some kind of a failure, you can figure out where to troubleshoot. Um, so that's why I did it this way. And that's why I um, you know, taught people how to build their environments manually first instead of relying on the automation tools to do it for them. Um, then of course, you know, there's always the wanting to get back to the community. Um, you know, believe it or not, I wasn't born an InfoSec expert. I was a SysOp in Ann Arbor, Michigan for about three years. And then I uh, moved out to uh, the East Coast and made friends at a hackerspace out here uh, called an allocated space. And that's how I got involved in the uh, InfoSec scene and how I got into doing talks and things like that. So um, I had people saying, this is how you use Armitage. This is how you use Metasploit. Throw MSOA. away. I was like, what is this? And then all of a sudden I have a shell on a system. It's like, oh, this is awesome. So this is just kind of my way of, you know, giving back knowledge to the community. I've given it out for free for the last six months. And my access logs on my server are just ridiculous. I've got um, over the last uh, two months, I had over 2,000 unique IP addresses and like 600 unique organizations, like places like U.S. Senate picking up the book and reading it. And I'm just like... That is kind of scary to see, like, Department of Justice and Department of State um, IP addresses and various military bases. And, like, at one point, I'm pre- I had a, um, a naval officer in Hawaii just come up and or send an email and say, hey, you said that the book was finished or you got this part finished. Can I see a copy of it so I can train the rest of my squadron? And that's what they did. And I was just like, this is freaking crazy. So... I just gave it out for free while I'm working on it. At some point when I get it in a condition that I deem good, I am probably going to try and sell it online, you know, because money's a thing. Uh, that's, that's really all there is to it. But, you know, 
if for some reason later on down the line, if you guys are like, I really would want to see this content, but I don't have the money for it. The money is not that much of an issue to me. I don't care. Email me and I will get you a copy for free. So for right now, it's available for free. And later on, if you need it that badly, I will get it to you for free. So just a heads up on that. So there were some fun things that I learned while I was working on this project. Um, the quickest way to figure out you don't know what you're doing or the quickest way to figure out that you're not a master at something is to try and write a book about it. Uh, that's what I've discovered. Um, the first thing that I had figured out was, you know, I was like, oh my God, uh, Client Hyper-V is awesome. It's uh, built into the OS. It's just about as good as VMware Fusion or Workstation. And it's absolutely amazing that it's practically free. And then I tried um, setting up the network bridging for Snort and Suricata, and I figured out that um, you need Mac spoofing enabled on the network interfaces that are going to be bridging those two IPS networks together in order for the traffic from to go from one side to the other. Like I would see, I would run TCP down and I'd see broadcast traffic going through and then I would try to hit something on the internet and nothing would work. And I went through four or five different Microsoft forums. I got redirected three or four times through TechNet until they finally dropped me in like the, the uh, Hyper-V forums and said, hey, take a look at this blue coat guide that has set up for HA. It's like, you know, max spoofing is the one checkbox I didn't check in the entire network adapter section. Let's see if this works. You know, I've got nothing to lose at this point. I had spent like weeks trying to figure this out. Then I set that up and I got uh, port mirroring set up on the uh, VMs and suddenly everything worked. Um, it's the same story for ESXi and that you need to have a uh, promiscuous mode um, enabled for the virtual switch that the virtual switches you're going to be bridging. And you also need to have uh, Mac spoofing and security disabled for those virtual switches. And again, that's something that I picked up by via trial and error. It's not anything that was really documented terribly well. And that reminds me of um, one more fun thing. If you are going to try out client Hyper-V and you have a solid state disk, um, don't try running your VMs on XFAT. That was another thing. XFAT is a file system that is tr like associated with SSDs. Uh, it's relatively recent. And for some reason, Hyper-V throws a fit and just refuses to run with them. It just refuses to work. And again, this was something that I picked up that was like an obscure issue that some sysadmin found in server 2008 when Hyper-V first came around. It was like, why can't I run these on this uh, external SSD that I have running. And, you know, I was like, oh, this is probably the problem. So I reformatted the drive I had to NTFS and suddenly everything was happy. Um, I don't really like how OSX handles its networking stack uh, when it comes to hosted hypervisors, uh, Fusion and VirtualBox. Um, the fun thing about those is that uh, you know, in Windows, when you have a uh, hosted hypervisor like uh, Workstation or um, VirtualBox, and you have a virtual interface that's created, the interface stays there and it's in the uh, network connections menu. It's there for you to give it an IP address, configure it, uh, um, unbind protocols, bind new protocols to it. It's for all intents and purposes, it's the same as a physical network card. In the OSX world, when you turn off the hypervisor or you t shut down the machine, that virtual or that virtual interface just disappears. The um, OS just says, "Oh, well, you're not using this, so it's gone." What does this mean to you? Is that um, uh, parts of the guide I teach students how to set up static routes and how to uh, and how to uh, configure IP addresses on their virtual interfaces. That's what makes, that's another thing that makes the guide so great is that for hosted hypervisors, you can take your uh, laptop or your workstation that's running this lab. And so long as you have an internet connection and you're bridging it um, to the PFSense VM, you can plug this lab in anywhere and it's good to go. So, that's where the problem was with OSX is that when you turn off the hypervisor or you shut down the machine and turn it back on that virtual network interface, your virtual networking is just gone. 
So you have to bring it back up, and I made automation scripts, and I put it, I documented all this in the book to where, you know, when you bring the VM back up, here's a shell script that you can run that will rebuild your static routes and reset the IP address because just everything about OSX net networking stack when it comes to virtualization software is just so weird. Um, there were various little issues that I had with uh, VMware Fusion where if when you go to create a VM, the first thing it would assume that you wanted to do was you want to start the VM. It's like, well, yeah, of course I do. And then you realize you didn't have the option to specify like um, an ISO or DVD to boot from and actually install an OS. So Fusion would boot to a blank disk and it would say, there's no operating system here. It's like, well, yeah, duh. And uh, it was just a little weird, annoying issue. Um, ESXi was a lot of fun. Um, you know, in addition to the networking stack issues that I had uh, mentioned earlier with uh, Mac spoofing and whatnot, um, they switched their web interface to HTML5, which is great because in the past, all you, the only way you had to access an ESXi box was through uh, uh, vSphere, uh, the vSphere management server or through the vSphere client for Windows. And having it HTML5 based now means that uh, if you have any kind of a modern OS, BSD, Linux, whatever, and it has a modern uh, web browser on it, Chromium, Firefox, um, whatever, you can log in and manage your VMs. And that's absolutely amazing if you're running on a budget lab and you don't have um, money for a vSphere management server, you know, because that stuff costs a, a good chunk of change. Um, the last thing I found out was probably the coolest thing. I use this uh, for uh, MACCDC as well. So uh, PowerShell is pretty fun. There is a tool that's uh, provided my, by uh, Microsoft called uh, VMware Converter. Uh, the current version is 3.0. And when you use this tool, you can use it to take VMDK files, like uh, virtual machines that are VMware format, and you can convert them to Hyper-V. So... That's how I uh, showed. Uh, that's how I showed a lot of the uh, readers to how to convert uh, the Metasploitable 2 VM that's in VMDK format and convert it to VHDX, which is what Hyper V uses. And um, recently, I did the same thing when I was doing uh, CCDC. Um, my buddy Ben sent me a VM, and it was in VMDK format. I was like, oh, I'm just going to use uh, Hyper V, and then the VMware converter did the job just fine. Um, it was just a PowerShell script, you import it, you tell it, uh, here's the VMDK files, here's where I want to set the VHDX, and um, then you would tell uh, Hyper-V, this is where the uh, image file is, boot from that, and everything more often than not worked perfectly fine. So it was a really useful tool. Um, but that in the uh, VMware um, standalone converter, that was another great tool for getting virtual machine images from uh, different operating systems or uh, from different virtualization formats, getting those uploaded onto ESXi easily. Um, those are both great uh, virtualization tools for, you know, managing, you know, this image or this virtual machine is in this type of image and I need it to go to this. What is the easiest way for me to get there? And that's all stuff that I cover in the book as well for, you know, converting various uh, VM images and, Converting the VMs from one format to another so they work with whatever software you have. So I'm going to try doing the demo and I'm going to hope that I don't lose my screen here. All right. So I'm doing this on client Hyper-V. I know I sound like a Microsoft commercial at this point, but um, I really think it's quite awesome. And I know the text is small, so please bear with me. I'm sorry. Um, I got a couple of extra VMs here uh, from the baseline lab. Like I got a Windows 7 VM that I just throw malware at for fun. Um, there's the Sim VM that's running Splunk. Um, there's the IPS VM. Um, there's my copy of Kali Linux, Metasploitable 2, PFSense. Um, it's all there and running. Uh, I have Kali Linux running right here. I've got uh, Armitage running in the background. Um, I got a couple of uh, VMs that I have targeted. So this VM or this uh, Kali Linux VM is at uh, 172.16.4.2. That is in the IPS1 network. 
they're in the same logical IP address range. They're in the 172.16.4 slash 24 network, but they are both on different network segments. And the Suricata VM is currently bridging those two networks together. Without the Suricata VM, I wouldn't be able to talk to either of these uh, two systems. This one right here is the Metasploitable 2 VM at 4.3, and this one is the Windows 7 box at 4.4. I would not be able to say, for instance, ping both of them and, you know, be able to talk to them at all. I wouldn't be able to curl to the um, Metasploitable 2 VM right now. And just to give you a quick demonstration, I you just saw that I was able to ping them just fine. Um, a demonstration of that fail close functionality that I was mentioning earlier. Um, I'll just turn the VM off right now, the IPS VM off. So. Right now it's turned off. And if I go back to uh, the Kali Linux VM and I try to run the same ping command that's pinging both of those IP addresses just once, nothing happens. So they're closed off. They can't talk to uh, Kali and Kali can't talk to them. Um, and just to kind of show you what it looks like from the other end here's my windows 7 box and yep i am a terrible uh, software pirate i will deal with that later um i can't reach 4.2 that's the kali linux vm but i can reach 4.3 the metasploitable vm that's in the same network segment so that's the quick and dirty uh demonstration of what's going on there with the um bridging those networks together and I have Suricata, I have a install scripts for Suricata and Snort set up to where um, when you bring the VM up, you turn it back on, it starts as a service. So all you got to do is shut the VM off to um, close it off. And all you have to do is turn it back on and bring it back up and the service starts automatically on boot. And uh, the uh, IPS VM has a Splunk Universal's forwarder installed on it, so any IPS events that it sees, it gets forwarded over to the uh, Splunk server that is sitting at 172.16.3.3, that management network that we mentioned earlier. So I did a, uh, I threw a Hail Mary. Um, if you guys are familiar with Armitage terminology, a uh, Hail Mary is, uh, Armitage sees a VM or sees a system, it's running Linux, it says, I think all of these apply to it. I'm going to throw all of these uh, these uh, exploits at it and hope that something sticks and gives me a shell. So I just use that as like a test battery to make sure that the IPS is awake and it's actually working and it's doing its job. And suddenly I have IPS alerts everywhere. Um, IRC commands, I see backdoor requests, I see uh, FTP logins, you know, so this is evidence that the IPS is there and running in addition to that fail open and fail close functionality. Um, I teach users how to set up firewall rule chains on PFSense for uh, the external uh, interface, the WAN interface that's connected to the bridge network, as well as, you know, setting up firewall rules to control access to assets that are in that management network. And finally, um, how to control access to or what systems are allowed to reach out to the internet or talk to other hosts on the local network in your IPS 1 and 2 networks. So we go through doing all of that stuff in the book. Um, yeah, I said before that it's over 500 odd pages, but the way that the book is laid out, it's kind of a choose your own adventure thing. So page is like dude that sounds like a semester's worth of work and more along the lines it's what hypervisor do you have or what do you need to know to get to that point pick a hypervisor and follow the guy through and you'll end up with this lovely network that you can turn into whatever you want afterwards so that was the quick and dirty of the demo and i made sure to have a couple of screen captures in here to kind of say this is how it works. This is um, the Kali VM that's uh, pinging the Metasploitable box. Here's uh, evidence that can curl it. Here's evidence that we got shells and IPS alerts, uh, things along those lines. But um, the live demo worked, so we're just gonna breeze right past that. And that's really all there is to it. Uh, 
that was the Avatar project in a nutshell. So I have a bunch of dudes here that uh, over the last six to eight months who have uh, helped me do editing, who have let me promote it, let me talk about it. That and that's really all there is to it. Um, just uh, to start off, you know, feel free to think of any questions that you have so far. But um, hey, Tony, could you just go back real quick? Um, you don't have to do the demo again, but just to the uh, network topology, the image. Absolutely. Um, during the demo, since you know, since it's on on the projector, it's sort of hard to see. Uh, let me bring that up here. So I'll try and like uh, give you a description of what's going on there. So the IPS VM has three network interfaces on it, right? Um, one of them I have set up to where I can uh, talk to it through SSH. That's on the management network. That's the CM VM. So, and of course, because I rebooted it, that's offline, but I also teach readers how to set up uh, SSH key-based authentication for their lab VMs if they want to do it. But uh, this is the IPS VM. This is its list of interfaces. You'll notice that out of the three that are listed here, only one of them has an IP address, and that's in the management network there. And then the other two are what uh, Suricata is using to bridge that IPS one and two network. And they don't, they don't have an IP address. They're running in promiscuous mode. They're set up to not respond to ARP requests. And that's how this Kali VM is able to talk to the Metasploitable 2 VM and ping it and curl it and throw exploits at it and do all sorts of things and get the, the shell callbacks to go back to the VM and picking up the alert, you know, in this bridge interface right here, that's how we get uh, those lovely alerts on the, uh, the uh, SIM VM. So, and then again, you know, you saw where I just, all I had to do was just click, turn it off and suddenly these two can't talk to one another. This one can't talk to anything. The Kali VM can't talk to anything in here. And it's a quick surefire way to um, isolate these hosts. Um, you know, the more tech savvy or the uh, more advanced among you will say, well, what about hypervisor escapes? What about uh, those kind of zero days? Um, you know, those things have a tendency to happen. Um, there are such thing as VM escapes, but the way that I teach readers how to build the VMs, I try to minimize that as much as possible. So, so um, excess virtual hardware, you know, like audio cards, um, excess network cards, ex excess uh, SCSI adapters, um, making sure that drag and drop and copy and paste aren't enabled. So the only way you're accessing these systems is over the network. Um, we do that, you know, I, I teach readers how to set it up in such a way to where you're minimizing your risks. So does that um, kind of help explain what's going on there? Yeah, definitely. Um, do you guys want to throw out some questions? Yeah, I do. Um, so if you're running all these VMs at one machine, if you are, how much RAM have you got there? What's the kind of processor that you have there? So um, as a starting point, uh, what I recommended for most, most users, um, the starting point I recommend is at least 16 gigs of RAM and about 500 gigs of disk. Okay. Um, most laptops these days, you know, MacBook Pros, uh, things along those lines, are going to have that level of hardware right at the get-go. Most uh, hard drives you see out there these days, they're usually terabyte or more or 750 gigs or more. So if you have a desktop available, you're probably going to hit that really easily. Um, even more if you have a refurbished server, like if you got a little bit of spare change, a, um, a Dell R710, like those things go for about 400 bucks and most of the times they have like 32 plus gigs of RAM in them, eight cores in them, and they are super cheap and easy to set up just about anywhere. So I like make sure to talk about that. So that's like one of the first things in the uh, beginning chapters that I talk about is like, this is the starting point. This is how much hardware you're going to need to run this lab reliably. Um, there is such a thing as IO contention, there is CPU cycle contention, and these are things that you have to think about if you expand your lab or you make it any bigger than this. So like I set the bar pretty low and I say, this is your starting point and this is how you can make a baseline with this much hardware. And then for those additional networks that I show you, the um, sample networks that uh, do various things, 
I even say, this is how much hard drive space and RAM and CPU you're going to need for all of these. And, you know, kind of give it, um, readers an idea if they want to expand past that baseline network, this is what they need to expect and this is what they need to plan for. Yes. And um, yeah, the other thing being uh, how picky some bare metal hypervisors, like if any of all, any of y'all have installed ESXi before in the past, you know that it's very picky about what network hardware and what uh, uh, storage rate or RAID arrays or RAID controllers it will pick up. So I make sure to mention that too. And I say, you know, if you go with um, a refurbished Dell or HP server, you're probably going to be fine. If you're trying to hack something together with a um, a gigabyte bricks box or something you're going to have a lot more fun trying to figure out how to get it to load all the drivers so i make sure to discuss a lot of that stuff in depth you know uh hardware requirements and uh, hardware compatibility for the different hypervisors out there great thanks um when you went through the demo did you you know uh walk through the reader on how to set up Splunk and also connect it to the different VMs, correct? That is correct. That is 100% correct. There is a demo guide where I show users how to uh, set up Snort and Suricata. It's essentially a script that I wrote for them. It's available on GitHub. So, you know, if something happens and I get hit by a bus or something, the book's still relevant and you're able to set it up. The script's freely available. It's all open source. And then as far as setting up uh, Splunk uh, Universal Forwarder and setting up Splunk Enterprise uh, Edition, I guide the user through, you know, here's how to download it, here's how to get an account on Splunk.com, um, here's how to start it up and have it uh, configured to start up on boot, here's how you have the IPS VM say, my indexer is over here, I'm going to send my logs this direction. Um, Here's how to install the technical apps or the uh, little applets that you need to have on the universal forwarder so it knows how to parse um, Snort or Suricata logs. So I go through all of that in depth you know, to make sure that the uh, reader knows how to run all those commands and what to expect when they're running it. And there are um, illustrations all over the book. I put screen caps everywhere because you know technical books tend to be boring. They tend to suck and nobody wants to read them. So if you got pictures, maybe you can say, oh, this looks like I'm going in the right direction. Cool. I'll keep going with it. Um, so at DePaul, we have agreements with Microsoft and VMware. So we have access to both ESXi 5.5, 6, and Hyper-V. Um, if you had to pick one, which would you pick and why? If you had um, so it depends on what hardware I have available to me. Like if I had a R710 laying around or an R720 with like 16 cores and 32 or 64 gigs of RAM and like a uh, one terabyte RAID array and SSDs and all that stuff, I'm going to pick ESXi every single time. Um, but if I want to make my lab mobile, like uh, let's say for instance, I wanted to bring it on a laptop or something, um, I am... If you couldn't tell by the aliens in the background and all the images and all, or on all the slides, I'm a gamer. I run around on Windows all the time. So um, Client Hyper-V has been tremendously uh, useful. Uh, it has a small learning curve if you're more familiar with VMware products, but uh, it's um, what I recommend if you're on a Windows environment. And um, if you're running around on a Mac, uh, Fusion's usually, uh, VMware Fusion is usually the gold standard. And on uh, Linux environments, either uh, VirtualBox, if you don't have a budget, Workstation, if you do. So uh, to answer your question, I prefer ESXi and uh, Client Hyper-V. Cool. Quick question regarding Splunk. Um, I know one of the common pitfalls of running Splunk, especially at work, is that um, it's more of like a license issue. Like, have, you, have you ever blown the license uh, with like at least the base one that they provide? So the base one, uh, okay, so that is um, actually another interesting thing that I cover in the book. Yeah, you're, you're starting to see a pattern here. Um, the base license for Splunk Enterprise Edition, it's 500 megabytes, which, you know, that's not too terribly much to most people. You know, 500 megs, that's less than I have in a Gmail inbox by a lot. 
um, you know, or and others will tell me or ask me why didn't I do uh, Elk or Elasticsearch Logs Dash Kibana because um, the setup for Splunk is really easy. It's uh, w get this uh, this URL. Go to this URL. Use this wk command on your uh, VM and use dpackage to uh, attack i to install it, and you're good to go. Yeah. With uh, Elk Stacks, it's either here's a custom VM image or here's a bunch of repos that you have to install and you have to run various commands to get them to run. And there are a lot of moving parts. Um, not to say that there isn't with Splunk, but they're all kind of prepackaged and you install one package and you're good to go. Um, the other part is I also teach uh, students, or you want to put it, um, that there are ways where you can request a uh, dev license for Splunk. Um, now, whether or not they accept it and they give you it is another thing, because they used to give them out like candy, and my understanding, they still do, but if you apply for a dev license, you can get up to 10 gigabytes of logs per day, which is, for a lab environment, more than enough. And I'm sure if you guys uh, there had a joint lab environment at DePaul, then you said, we're doing it for security research, as one will say, hey, DePaul uh, Security Gamins is using this, and they'll give you some... They'll probably give you something crazy like a 100 gig license or something like that. You know, way more data than you need. Uh, like, if you're running this on a laptop, um, you would be very hard-pressed to take the amount of data you're logging um, for individual analysis past 500 megabytes. But if you do and you can get a dev license, um, that takes you up to 10 gigabytes really easily. And Splunk is incredibly usable. I mean, I'm not saying that Elk and uh, Kibana are not. Just that there is a lot more setup involved in those systems, uh, as opposed to just pick it up and go. Yeah, I think, um, but you like considering the nature of this lab, where you know you're trying to facilitate, you know, rapid, uh, rapid deployment, you know, of, of this type of uh, environment, right? Um, this, you know, you can use Elk as a stepping block, right? You can start with Splunk, and then if you want to, you can move over to Elk, right? Right, that's and that's uh, so, you know, that's another part of it. Is like I'm teaching you how to use Splunk. If you've never used a sim before, this is the easiest one to pick up and go. But if you're like, I'd rather use Elk, I'm like, that's great. If you know how to install it and you know how to set it up, you're more than welcome to do it that way. And um, um, maybe further on down the line, at some point, I was considering doing uh, additional guides. Um, you know, kind of specializing the lab in one direction or another. So maybe for the um, malware analysis or NSM lab, you would want to know how to sell, install Elk because you're expecting a lot more traffic and you're expecting a lot more uh, data to be gathered. So that might be one possible direction is if I continue writing this, if this book is anything resembling successful and I continue with it, maybe say, here's how you install Elk instead. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was just about to ask what's next with the book other than, for, you know, publishing it. So, uh, the project, as it stands, I am actually rather surprised with how popular it's gotten. Um, I've, uh, I've posted it to Reddit's uh, um, Ask, uh, Ask NetSec, our malware, and our sysadmin got a bunch of hits through that. Um, the, uh, the peer, the, uh, the founders for Peerlist, Peerlist.com is um, a little infosec uh, posting board where a bunch of people post uh, different news or different things that uh, they found in the industry that they thought were interesting. Um, I've had the community organizer, the head of the, uh, the, the original founder go and say, this is the Avatar project and you should go and use this. I'm just like, it's still a work in progress. Oh my God, you're putting so much, like the hype is real. So... Um, that is to say, like, there's been a lot of buzz about it, and I'm, I'm really happy about that because, you know, it's free, and I wanted to make sure that uh, viewers like you got access to something so nice like this to learn how to build their own labs. But as of right now, um, I have something like 200-plus edits. Uh, my uh, One of my colleagues, uh, this guy uh, is named Lord Gunter. Uh, I met him through Twitter. Uh, the guy is German and English is a second language and 
um, pardon my French, but he's been whooping my ass uh, in terms of grammar and mechanics, and the guy has been schooling me severely. And not only that, you know, in addition to having that uh, level of or that command of the English language, he also has the technical knowledge to kind of say this doesn't make sense or you want to change this around these these steps don't go the way you think they do so he has been the one that's been doing practically all of my technical right or all of my uh all of my editing and i have never met the guy and he's just has done it for free i was just like there's got to be something i can do for him but you know if you ever hear of him or see him anywhere out there that's the guy you need to thank for making this thing readable. So just throwing that out there. Um, I've got all of those edits to go through. And then eventually what I would like to do is um, throw it into this, uh, this program called Scrivener that is used for writing books. It's, um, a, it's uh, one of the, it's a, it's a publishing program or a way for you to format your data to where you can just hand it off to a publishing company like uh, Amazon or something of that nature, and they can take it and run with it. So at some point, I don't know where I'm going to distribute it, but I've, I'm thinking Amazon would probably be the easiest way because you can do physical imprint copies pretty easily through them, or at least that's what I've heard. This whole book publishing thing is um, a pretty new venture in my life. I've never done it before, so um the first step is just getting it done and getting all the edits finished and then figuring out uh where to put it up after that so i guess the best answer i have for that question is um once i have it finished um i will be figuring that part out definitely. and, and I, I i think i'm speaking for everyone here we definitely appreciate this book and we'll definitely run with it um and also i, I i'm surprised i I might have missed it, but I haven't seen this on the front page of Hacker News, I think. That's something another way to explain. So, um, if you guys got like a couple of seconds, this is something that I do every so often. So, I don't know if I'm still sharing my screen here. Can you guys see it? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so this is my web server. Um, Every so often, what I will do is uh, I will go through my access logs for a period of time, like two or three weeks, and I will grep for um, avatar in all caps, then grep for uh, get in all caps for HTTP get requests, then uh, grep for PDF. And that returns all users or all IP addresses or all HTTP requests that are specifically grabbing the PDF and pulling it back. And then I um, will cut that data out. Um, the first line that's in your access logs is the IP address that made the request. I will cut that first line out and I will feed those IP addresses to whois.kimru.com. And they will tell me what organization it was, where they are geolocated. And um, I will often go through that data and I'll, to figure out who has requested the book at a specific time. And this is like a list of results that I've gotten before. Like there have been some very interesting results I've gotten. So National Institute of Health, um, University of Georgia. I've had um, Saudi, or I've had users on Saudi Nat, um, um, networks on Hawaii, banks, MasterCard, um, the more really fun one here is love and travel stop in country stores like out in the middle of nowhere i was just like i some i must be making somebody's night and like helping them have a lot of fun is all i can figure somebody must be very bored to be pulling this while they're at work but uh it's insane um just the number of results i get back on um a couple of weeks over a couple of weeks even yeah i mean I, I, at least from following you on Twitter, it's Monday, but hopefully after today, you'll see either DePaul or some IPs from Chicago. <laughs> um, but yeah, is there any other questions? Um, Tony, do you have anything, you know, since this is a, we're recording this as well, do you have anything to say to like the students starting off in the InfoSec field? So, 
the best piece of advice I can give you is don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, and I'm going to be frank here and pardon my French again. There are a lot of people who call themselves professionals who are really just assholes and will put you down. Don't pay attention to them. You know, there are a lot of us, there are a lot more out of us out there who appreciate that you all are coming into the field and are looking to get your start because as you very well know, we're understaffed as it is. There are way more security, there are more and more security events going on day to day, week to week, all of that stuff than there has been in any other point in history. And we need all the help we can get. And even if I'm the, uh, even if I'm the only one to do it, you know, feel free to reach out. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, if you have something that you want to talk about or like you're looking to get your start in information security, consider like writing about your experiences, uh, doing some kind of a blog and maybe, you know, blogging about um, maybe you did a CTF and you were completely puzzled by one piece, but you knew how to do another, you know, do some kind of a write up or uh, write about just the experiences, uh, putting the avatar project lab together or something along those lines. Um, consider speaking at local conferences as well. Um, you know, a lot of us uh, would rather, you know, be sitting in our basements and chilling and uh, doing whatever else, but uh, going out there and speaking and talking to others and uh, networking, that's how I got practically all of my last couple of jobs. Um, so I have to say, it's very important for you to go out there and make friends and, you know, build your, uh, build your little spy rings too, you know, especially if you're going into the blue team stuff and doing threat intelligence, you know, making friends and saying, have you seen this before? Or have you seen this going on? And having them say, yeah, and I have a sample of it, here you go. That's the kind of, that's really cool stuff that you just get just by uh, talking with your friends at a conference. That's like the, the biggest, that's like the biggest thing that I can tell you is uh, make friends and be nice to others. And if you have to deal with assholes or if you feel somebody's giving you a raw deal in the security industry, it's a very small world. So news travels fast. If you get a raw deal, news travels really, really quickly. Uh, that's that's really I know it sounds like a bunch of random gibberish, but I mean, that's the best advice I can give you is uh, get involved in the community, do some talks, and don't be afraid to network with others.